welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear, the podcast conversation with a change maker working to accelerate the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society. I'm your host, Mitch Radcliffe. Today, let's talk sustainable fishing. Our guest is Sean Wittenberg. He's the founder of the seafood company, Safe Catch. He started the business with a mission to source safe and sustainably caught tuna and other fish after his mother was diagnosed with mercury poisoning after she adopted a diet that included frequent servings of canned tuna. The Sausalito, California-based Safe Catch offers a wide variety of fish products in cans and pouch packaging, and the fish is certified by the Marine Stewardship Council, the provider of the familiar and often controversial MSC blue check label that you find on seafood cans. Safe Catch tests every tuna that it sells for mercury, enforcing standards that it claims are 10 times stricter than the Food and Drug Administration's basic requirements. It also offers detailed sustainability information about its practices for each species of fish that it sells. The company relies primarily on purse-saying net fishing. It's a form of fishing that involves large nets, and we're going to discuss how Safe Catch assesses its suppliers in an era when 10% of the world's fish stocks is described by the Mindaroo Foundation as being on the brink of collapse, and almost half of fish stocks are overfished. You can learn more about Safe Catch at safecatch.com. Safe Catch is all one word, no space, no dash, safecatch.com. Welcome to the show, Sean. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Mitch. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. I, I, I want to start off. Tell us what happened with your mother. I mean, it was the catalyst for Safe Catch's creation. What's the story? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, yeah, it was a it was a pretty scary experience. It happened in really 2001 to 2002, and I was studying at UC Davis in California, and I had come back for a holiday break to find my mom unwell. Now, she was having issues, cognitive problems and motor skill problems. And up until this point, it's important to note that my mom was in perfect health. Um, mm -hmm. She had, she, you know, she was sharp. She was doing construction, interior design. She was tutoring kids. She was super active, active mind, active lifestyle. And I came back and she just was unwell. She was forgetting things, fatigue. Um, she would bump into things. She had motor problems. She'd have to grip things just to, to stay balanced. It was, it was weird. And so when we took her to the doctor, because the symptoms were so all over the place, they thought that she had cancer. And so the beginnings of this, this is 2000, you know, one, 2002 at this time, I understanding of mercury toxicity was very, very low. My, my family really didn't know anything about it. And so we were going down a path and she starts getting the full battery of tests, you know, everything you can get, and, you know, thank God she didn't have cancer. But then the doctors immediately wanted to pivot to autoimmune because they didn't know how these symptoms were, what was the genesis of these symptoms. And at this time, a nutritionist asked my mom, have you ever had your heavy metals tested? What are you, what are you talking about, right? Heavy metals, what? And sure enough, my mom goes and gets her heavy metals tested and her mercury concentration in her body was 10 times higher than what the FDA deemed was the acceptable maximum. And what happened and she, was she'd we were, been eating, she'd been eating off the shelf tuna. Yeah. So what happened was she was started a point-based diet system to manage weight. Mm -hmm. She's always been trying to manage weight, as many people do in the, around the world really now. And uh, she started this point-based diet system, and albacore tuna was one point. And at the time of this particular diet program, they had a very, very limited menu. My mom didn't like the other things on the menu. She loved albacore tuna. She loved tuna. So she started eating the tuna as her one point in the diet system. Six months later, not knowing that she was also accumulating you know, mercury in her body from that albacore tuna, she just spiked out. And so sure enough, they identified the problem was the the point-based diet system, the albacore, my mom stopped eating it. And she started a, about a two-year process, a combination of chelation and, and other strategies for removing the heavy metals from her body. Uh, it was a long, arduous road and, and uh, really difficult for her to deal with. But she's, she's healthy now, thank, you know, thank God, and she's doing well. And, uh, but it, it changed my life. Up until that point, I really didn't have a, a purpose. You know, you're in your you know, end of your teens, early 20s, you're just, you know, still in school, trying to find your way. And then this happens. And it just 
shaped me towards this problem. And I started to study mercury and why was this problem happening? Why wasn't there a solution? Is the issue technology? What was, how do we help this so other moms like my mom never has to experience getting sick from, from mercury? And uh, well, that's really how it all started. So the path from, um, you're a student, your mother gets ill, you figure out what goes on, you, you study it. How did you get from there to starting a company? Was that something you had even been thinking about doing with your life? No, 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 not at all. So, you know, my father was a pat, patent and trademark attorney. And so he knew patent law. And one of his good buddies was a guy named Travis Honeycutt. And Travis Honeycutt had a engineering lab with four PhD physicists in it. So we started to just, the three of us, I was at school in the sciences, studying physics, management, economics. I was in that space. My dad was a chemical engineer, then a patent attorney. His friend was also a uh, you know, PhD in chemistry. And then there, he had a four, four PhD physicists on his, in his laboratory. And we began kind of looking at the problem to try to see what was out there. And our first look, we, we started off funny enough, thinking we were going to do a home testing kit where people could test the fish at home, which just shows you how early you are in the thought process. And then you realize, well, that's not going to work because what happens? A, a family buys a piece of fish, they take it home, they test it, it's high in mercury. Now what? Do they bring it back to the grocery store? Do they throw it away? And what do you do? So obviously we had to go up the supply chain. And then we looked at going up the supply chain, we realized we needed an institutional tool that could test a lot and do so at a, at a, at a low cost. Um, and when we looked inside the the technology space, there was some great techs, right? There was uh, ICPMS, plasma mass spectroscopy. There was CVAA, cold vapor atomic absorption. These technologies are fantastic. You know, it's what you'd find in, in a standard uh, laboratory right now if you were to go get a, something tested for mercury concentration. But the, the issues with them is that they're very expensive. They require a lot of sample prep. Um, they require an operator that is sophisticated, that is highly educated to run this technology. Um, and they're expensive. You know, a, a test can be anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks each. And so the combination right. of, of personnel, people, laboratory, infrastructure, cost, for all these reasons, um, we've, we've decided we needed to develop a new technology that could rapidly test fish for heavy metals. Um, and so mm -hmm. that's what we set out to do. And we spent several years pioneering a technology that could take a tissue sample about the size of a grain of rice. And you can mm -hmm. put it into our machine. And in about 30 to 45 seconds, I can tell you the exact mercury concentration to the part per billion, thousand times more sensitive than the FDA standard. And I can do so accurately and for pennies on the dollar. And so we made this breakthrough machine, but uh, funny enough, that was just the first step <laughs> along the path. Right. Well, that's, to... Yeah. I mean, you know, so you solved a big problem. It, you did this out of the pocket. It sounds like it's not something you got funded and said, we're we, solve this we, we passed the tin cup around between friends and family. Um, mm -hmm. My family put up a lot of capital we didn't have. I mean, we all just went all in on this. You know, my mom was kind of this matriarch. Um, leader figure amongst our family and to see her unwell uh, really had us all going all in. And I found myself just dedicating every waking moment to, to this problem. So where do you test the fish? So is it, is it at the port? So, or the yeah. So it, it was a long process to, to that point. We started off early after we developed this technology, we, you know, we brought it to the government I sat down in Bethesda, Maryland with Dr. Atchison at the time, who ran food safety for the U.S. government under George W. Bush. And we laid this out for him. And we realized in that, in that meeting after we were there that, that the FDA and this particular area was grossly underfunded to realize its mandate. And so they, they had other things they were focusing against, but, um, this is when they couldn't get their 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 resources in around, and so we then pivoted to trying to work with companies. And so we took the technology to big tuna players and seafood distributors, and we started to try to find a way to either put our technology into seafood distributors in in, in regions like 
you know, the Bay Area or Oregon, Portland area, Seattle area, LA, uh, Chicago, Las Vegas. And we, and we did a lot of testing work there and B2B work around providing testing and certification for other seafood companies. But ultimately, no one wanted to um, adopt the standards that we knew were possible because they really wanted one of two things, mostly, particularly the big seafood players. And that was they either wanted us to test to a limit that was so loose that everything passed. And so that we created this feel good around a problem. And so either that or they wanted us to go away flat out. And so Mm -hmm. in both of those scenarios, um, my mom stays sick. And so my mom has remained my North Star through all of this. And so as we think about the choices we make, we think about would this protect my mom? Because if this protects my mom, then this protects all moms. And if you that that's the the mentality that that drives our company. And so, after about a decade of working um, with seafood distributors and installing our technology around the world and trying to collaborate, in 2013 we decided to pivot, and instead of being a collaborator with the brands, we decided to become our own brand and to develop a product that fully encapsulates all of our values. At its core is food purity, but also sustainability, social responsibility, the things that that we wanna see in all companies, regardless of the space they're in. And so that became Safe Catch. And from 2013 to today, we've continued to build on that foundation of of, purity, health and wellness, social and environmental responsibility. We've been able to walk forward as a as a company and and finding partners who believe in that as well and and customers who want to support that type of work. And now here we are, you know, we launched our first products in 2015. And so it's been, you know, we're about to enter our eighth year of of selling. And now you you were telling me before we started to record that you are now the the primary albacore tuna provider to Costco. So you're doing no, 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 the business. yellowfin, yellowfin, yellowfin. We, we, we don't do Sorry. that. Yeah, 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 yellowfin. There, you know, Costco is a tremendous partner of ours, and uh, you know, they really look towards quality, health, and wellness, and they care deeply about a lot of the things that we care about. And you know, they're all about providing a range of offering to their members, and they felt that our product worked well in their assortment and gave a choice to their members that they felt was important. And that opportunity was, you know, a game changer for us amongst others. I mean, we have tremendous partnerships. We just started a partnership in September with Walmart, which is a huge deal for us to get that. Thank you. And we have partnerships with everything from independent grocers up and down the United States and all the way to the Kroger's, Walmarts and Publix, HEBs of this world. Now, you also do other kinds of fish, salmon, mackerel, and so forth. Are you testing all yeah. of those fish or are primarily focused on the tuna? With everything that bears our name has is tested. Okay. Um, when it comes to highly migratory fish or fish that you know travel great distances like a tuna, we test every single one, one by one. No batch testing. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why we do that. When it comes to fish that are school-driven but live in in a certain geography and don't have that same travel path and and really live and grow and and die in their same regional area, we can provide statistical sampling algorithms where we can test 125 to 300 sardines from a catch. And that will give us a good sense of what the mercury concentration is in that sardine catch. But when it comes to tuna, because they're highly migratory and because the pollution in our environment is asymmetrical and they're swimming through different areas. We can talk about how this goes down. Uh, you can see huge variation within the actual school of tuna so that two fish that are the same size, the same school can vary in mercury concentration by over 10 times. So what you have here is you have two fish swimming side by side. One would be great for my mom. The other would not be a good choice for sure. my mom. Not, a, not an illegal fish, not a bad fish, not something that should be thrown away, but just not pure enough for you, for, vulnerable, for us and vulnerable consumers. And so 
that's why we realized we had to test at the source. So when we became safe catch, as opposed to doing the B2B work we did the first 10 years, when we pivoted to being our own brand, we brought our technology to the source where fish is landed and set up systems where we can test the fish and verify sustainability and ensure the raw material meets all of our standards at the source. Um, so we know before we buy the fish. And so we don't have to throw fish away or find someone else. We test it. Just like a sushi restaurant only buys the fish that meets their spec, we only buy the fish that meet our spec. And we just add mercury. How many or what percentage of fish pass your your standard? You know, it's it's, it's all over the place. But if I was to to drill it down to an an average, I would Mm -hmm. say on average about 25% 25% of the fish we test don't don't meet our standard. Okay. Uh, and about 25%, yeah. Now, now one of the things, and, and, and you sort of gestured it a moment ago, is different fisheries have different characteristics. And, and you're talking to me from Thailand at the moment where you're living now. Yeah, yeah. Do you avoid buying fish from certain markets because of the practices in those those regions? Well, we're, we, we find fishing partners that, meet our sustainability and social standards. Um, mm-hmm. We've recently partnered with the MSC, Marine Stewardship Council. Right. Um, they So we only buy fish that are certified by MSC as sustainable. Mm-hmm. Uh, that mark then is put onto our package and they help us communicate those standards. Um, so that's our big sustainability partner there. Um, we also do things that are incremental to MSC, although they do this work as well. And that was an artifact of facing problems as they come up. And I don't know if you remember the news, but in the early like 2015 time frame, there was some press around concerns of slave-like practices happening right. on tuna boats. And so for us, we don't buy transshipment tuna and we okay. only buy fish from vessels that have count on count off programs, which means before a boat goes out, every fisherman on that boat is registered and counted by an independent auditor to count them on that boat. Then when that boat comes in to bring in its its landing, its fish, it also has to then have each one of those fishermen counted off the boat and registered leaving the boat so that they can make sure that they're not trapped at sea. Those are some of the things that I never thought in my life, particularly not at UC Davis, you know, 20 years ago, thinking to myself, I've got to look out for these types of behaviors. I've got to protect our supply chain from these types of concerns. But as these problems arise, we're excited that not only us as a company, but everyone we're partnered with is hyper-focused on doing the right thing. You know, And so that's the key. Well, and doing the right thing is is a moving target because we're beginning to understand the world so much more deeply. I want to come back and talk more about that. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. We're back to continue the conversation with Sean Wittenberg, founder of the seafood company SafeCatch. So, Sean, the, the the Marine Stewardship Council certification, it's the blue check mark that a lot of people yeah. know, is, is counted on by a lot of people. And, and you're doing that and more. But what I want to ask about is MSC's certification requires traceability. You've put that in place. Does that also allow you to put criteria around the behavior of the fishermen, such as no bycatch, uh, all of the other fish that they didn't intend to catch in the net. Yes, uh, the, the bycatch, so classical sustainability um, has three criteria to it, three pillars. Mm-hmm. You have biomass, which is the standard, how big is the stock in the sea? You have fish mortality, which is are more fish being born than being harvested, right? You don't want to have some, you don't want to take out more fish than are born each year. Mm-hmm. And then the last one is bycatch. And that is, are you catching what you set out to catch? Now, in the tuna world, the biggest issue with bycatch is around fads. A fad is a fish aggregating device. Mm -hmm. And what a fad basically is, is a structure or a a float that goes out into the sea. Most of them have sonars in them, which would allow them to measure the biomass underneath these, these islands, these artificial islands. But what these artificial islands do at sea is they create an ecosystem. Small fish, bait fish are naturally attracted to shelter underneath this island. And given time, there's enough fish sheltering, they start to attract predators. And then predators attract more predators. Before you know it, you have a whole ecosystem Mm -hmm. underneath this fish aggregating device, underneath this little island. 
Now, traditional seafood boats would have to go out and find the tuna. And it was, they had spotter boats and there was a art and a science to that. Well, with fads, it's basically reading a, a, a sonar telling you go to this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, catch this, 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 this. Your boat is full, you're coming back. So a, a set that might take four weeks to eight weeks to catch all your tuna is now two weeks. And so for the fishermen, less time, more catch, all of that makes a ton of sense, less fuel. Um, but the reality is, is when you're going into those fads, you're putting this big net around it, you're personing the string and you're pulling the whole ecosystem out. So you're pulling out everything you don't want. Right. So for us as a company, we are, we just, we don't do fad. We, we're a fad free company. And the reason that you don't want to just, you know, yell at the nets, right. Is that there's another criteria for us and and, and that's climate change. It's, you have to be mindful of, of carbon, right? And wild tuna in particular is one of the best foods you can eat to fight climate change. And I'll tell you about that. So when you avoid the fads and you're catching fad-free or pole in line, bycatch is well under 1%. Some people say 0.3%. Some people say 0.1%. Whatever it is, it's well under 1%, well under a half a percent. And those are the acceptable levels of bycatch because that's the natural flow. And so when you had a what's called a free school or a fad-free tuna boat using a net, they're able to catch the most tuna possible for the fuel they're using without the bycatch and still meet the biomass and fish mortality criteria. So this is the most efficient way to catch skipjack, which is the light tuna you mostly see, or yellowfin tuna. This is the most efficient way to do that for the least amount of carbon. And when you catch this way, like, like in our yellowfin can, because we were talking about that. So our yellowfin can or our, or our skipjack can, if you were to take a four ounce serving of that, mm -hmm. it would take roughly two kilograms of carbon to create that four ounce serving, right? Which will give you 36 grams of protein. So you're talking yeah. about 36 grams of protein for two kilograms of Which carbon. Which is roughly four and a half pounds. Yeah, there you go. And so when you look at the um, beef industry, as an example, as the counterbalance to this, mm -hmm. right? That same four ounce burger patty to create would take 27 kilograms of carbon right. to create a four ounce burger, right? That would then give you 22 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. So you get 50% more protein and you actively remove 25 kilograms of carbon if you switch from going to get a burger, a meat burger, to a safe catch tuna sandwich. And so as you look at that dynamic, you're realizing that, that this tool, if you can get this tuna out of the sea sustainably, and you can do so socially responsibly, and you can deliver it to the consumer in a way where they can enjoy it because it tastes good, you're now creating a, an active way for consumers to make simple choices to combat climate change. So another factor that a lot of our listeners are concerned about is just the, the, the fish populations. And we're also expecting that seafood is going to play a bigger and bigger role in the human food supply over the next 30 years. Uh, well, it will. At least double. Where are we in terms of being really good stewards of those resources? And do you see potentially a role for farmed fish in addition to natural lion caught fish or purslane fish? Um, Mitch, this is a great, great question, and you're right on the money. Yes, um, there are certain fisheries that are doing a spectacular job. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, if you want to talk to, from my point of view, the gold, gold standard is Alaska. And they've been doing it for decades and decades and decades, and they're really set up sustainability before the terminology was really, you know, a, you know, known within the consumer world. That's just what they were doing since the beginning, managing. Um, quotas, registering vessels, managing bycatch, you know, auditing, doing, you know, creating traceability programs. And many others around the world have adopted similar practices to Alaska. And, and MSC has tried to create that to be normalized around the world. But there's certain areas where that's not being met. You know, a key example is let's just talk yellowfin tuna. If you looked at Yellowfin tuna in the central western Pacific Ocean, where it's being managed by that 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 those fisheries there, the PNA countries, 
um, as well as you know everyone in that 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 region. The biomass is healthy. It's audited. It's measured. The quotas, everything's being done at a very very high level. Illegal fishing is very very low in that area. Mm-hmm. The infrastructure is all geared towards sustainability. It's fantastic. If you go to the yellowfin fishery, as example, the pole line fishery in Maldives, that fishery has been depleted, mm-hmm. particularly the yellowfin population. It's now considered red ranked by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It doesn't have MSC certification. Um, it's a pole and line fishery. It's a pole and line fishery. But an overfished one. But an overfished one because of just not allowing the fundamentals of that fishery to be protected, you know? And so there's a skipjack population in the Maldives that's pole and line. That is still very healthy mm-hmm. because skipjack produces faster than yellowfin does, but the elephant population there has been depleted. So there's areas of concern where you can say, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in certain fisheries to help those stocks recover. But the thing that we need to know is, is that the tuna fisheries are resilient. If given the opportunity to rest and heal, they can really grow. You can see it happening right now outside of Hawaii. They've created a bunch of protected waters there that are no fishing zones. And by pr- creating some protected areas it's given a it's given a a sanctuary for these tuna to reproduce and get healthier in their stocks and so it, we need to not only recognize the problem we need to then provide the solution and tools for those fisheries to recover now you know an, another major issue is is the evolution of microplastics pollution and and understanding what it's done to the planet and it's being found in a lot of fish it's found in us too but yes we were talking before the break about how do we continue to evolve as we learn more about the world that we live in. Does Safe Catch have a team that is working to improve its practices all the time? Yes. I mean, that's, thank you for that question, Mitch. The, the reality is, is it's every day is an opportunity to get better than yesterday. Mm -hmm. And for us as a company, we're trying to understand our environment, where our fish is coming from, the impacts in their environment that could find their way to the plates of our customers and our consumers and and moms and kids around the world. And certainly we're beginning to understand more and more about the impacts of microplastics um, and what's happening in our oceans. And there's two dynamics at play that are feeding into this problem. You know, one is the reckless consumer behavior and one is the industrial side of the game, the industrial pollution that comes in. So reckless consumerism is just not paying attention to the source? No, reckless consumer behavior is is people's use and discharge of waste in okay. a way that uh, that gets into our environment. If you look at these big reefer vessels, um, not not just not tuna vessels, but you look at look at uh, like cruise ships or large vessels like that, they treat the ocean like their trash can. So you you leave these cruise ships don't come into port and unload tons of trash. They just drop tons of trash out of their boat in the open ocean and just discharges out the back of the ocean. So things around protecting our ocean are as simple as, you know, making sure that your single use plastics are getting into recycling bins and not getting into just landfill and into our oceans. And so for us as a company, what we did is we've partnered up with a group called Repurpose Repurpose um, is what is a company that's made safe catch plastic neutral. And so what we do with uh, Repurpose is they remove ocean plastics equal to all of the plastics we use in our company every year. And so right now we've pulled out 61,000 pounds of low value plastic waste from our environment to offset the plastics that we've used in our company. And we've put 120 waste workers and their family to work in low income um, areas like parts of India and and Colombia. And so these types of programs are how we're actively working to make sure that we're good stewards of the planet. Do we need though to evolve standards, including for cruise ships? I mean, what you just described is pretty shocking. So that like the aspirations of MSC to be able to certify that this was responsibly caught and the people who were doing the work are fairly treated, we're treating the ocean better. Is there, yes. you see that discussion starting to happen? 
Yeah, yeah, you see that discussion starting to happen. I mean, there's a, a a new level of awareness within the seafood community, fishermen, suppliers, distributors, understanding that that we have to treasure and protect this resource. And so, you know, people within the fishing communities are doing everything in their power to eliminate their waste drivers. But, you know, despite what some people believe, the real drivers of waste are coming from you know, industrial pollution, you know, I wanted to mention to you, we're like, why is this problem becoming more acute of mercury and fish, right? Well, since, since World War II to today, about 75 years, the mercury levels in our ocean have gone up three times, over 300% increase. And what's driving that? Well, what's driving that is coal-fired power plants, okay? Mm-hmm. When you look at uh, China or you look at India and you look at them in the 1970s or even 80s, they were agricultural nations. Yeah. And in a span of about 40 years, they went from agricultural nations to industrial powerhouses, and they did so on the back of coal. And when you burn coal, particularly without any environmental oversight or any scrubbers to remove the products of combustion, when you burn coal, mercury's in that coal. And when it gets to 425 Celsius, it vaporizes. Right. And that, that gas, mercury gas, now goes up into the upper stratosphere, goes into the clouds. When the clouds fall, I mean, when the rain falls, so does the mercury from the clouds. Mm -hmm. And then that gets into our oceans. And then when uh, elemental mercury, HG, reacts with salt water, a chemical reaction takes place, becomes a new organic compound called methylmercury. Methylmercury is a real dangerous stuff that you see in seafood Mm -hmm. because that methylmercury sticks to plant life. And then smaller fish eat the plant life. And then bigger fish eat the smaller fish. And through a process known in the scientific community as biomagnification, the mercury concentration um, goes up as you go up the seafood supply chain. So, you know, halibut will be more than sardines and sharks will be more than halibut. In this case of us, you know, we're in the tuna environment, which is up on the upper side of the, sure. of the um, food chain for the seafood uh, hierarchy. And so that's what, that's what's really happening, sir. So as you see what America has done, right? And this will talk to you a little bit about, um, we put tons of scrubbers, tons of investments into eliminating Uh, mercury pollution. There's, you know, all types of regulation. It became very strong, particularly during the Obama administration. And we've seen our mercury pollution levels from the America drop. But the rest of the world, particularly these emerging um, industrial nations, as we mentioned, they're not, they're not creating those policies. And so when you see that, and you layer that on top of a um, decrease in biodiversity in our oceans, which means you have less organisms to shoulder this mercury load, you're starting to create even greater concentrations in the seafood supply chain. And then when you have climate change and global warming, these fish are moving faster and burning more energy, which makes them eat more fish, which are accumulating more mercury. So you have these other, you have these other drivers happening while the, the levels are going up, which is accelerating the concentration effort of mercury and fish. So we're as a company deeply, deeply focused on finding alternative energies, not just for climate change, but for protecting our ecosystems. Because what we know, and I'm sure, Mitch, you and your listeners are aligned with us here, is that our environment, our inputs, our food, our water, our air, and our health and the health of our families are all connected. Mm -hmm. So when you're making a motion to eliminate or protect coal-fired power plants or plastics pollutions or any one of these things that we've been talking about, when you put those controls in place, you can start to not only help the environment, the plant, the animals, and all the life in our oceans. You're going to help the welfare and the health and wellness of our communities, our families, and ourselves. Well, you know, this all makes the discussions going on at COP27, which is happening as we're speaking, all the more relevant. Mm-hmm. If we yeah. make investments to lower the emissions, then we can save the oceans from mercury poisoning. And those kinds of connections are things I don't think we really make often enough. There's one last thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, and that is your recycling program. Your cans are recyclable uh, in yeah. uh, but You make plastic pouch seafood and you have a recycling program. Tell us about the recycling program and, and the incentives you put in place because they're pretty generous, both for the consumer. Yeah, I mean, we... we you know, when you move the, 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 the great benefit of the, the four layered pouch or the, the plastic pouch, the advantage of it is very light. And as we were looking at ways to 
to lighten our carbon load, we have an aspiration in our company of being carbon neutral as well. Um, as we look to try to lower that, the plastic pouch made a ton of sense because it's lighter than a steel can, although a steel can is much easier to recycle. But there's groups out there that can like that can do this for you. TerraCycle, if you if you're not familiar with them, your listeners are an incredible organization that are focused on recycling everything, everything that can be, from batteries to plastic pouches to all the things that people otherwise say are impossible to recycle. And they can recycle these pouches of ours. And so we created a program where if you would to send in 10 pouches, we'll give you 10% off your order and you can, um, your next order, a 10% coupon for every time you put in, send us 10 pouches off your next order. Our goal was to create a subscription program where we send you products in the mail because it's light in a plastic pouch. You send us back in a box your pouches. We send you a coupon. We'll send those in to repurpose for you. And when you took that program and you layered it against our repurpose program, which made us plastic neutral, now we could be in the in the black, so to speak, where we're actively giving a being neutral and then recycling from a position of neutrality is now being active participants in removing ocean plastic. Well, and you're also giving a dollar for every 10 pouches to the Ocean Foundation. That's another great way to support the kinds of change we're talking about. What kinds of programs yes. is catch donation contributing to now in that? I mean, we're we're trying to find anyone and everyone in a in a kind of like a micro perspective. We want to look at people who might not get the type of big awareness. MSC as an example is a global program. It's huge. Everyone knows that they're doing a great job, but there are smaller groups regionally doing beach cleanups, doing um, community-based um, plastic um, pickups, recycling. And so we find ways to support those communities and then to also use our actual product to support those communities by donating products to those that are um, less fortunate, people who are trying to are having a hard time eating healthy foods, um, low-income, no-income communities, homeless communities, and being able to, to give product back as well so we can help those in need while also helping clean up communities on a local basis. So, Sean, I want to thank you for taking time to talk with us. How can follow our listeners follow along with what you're doing and, and, and check out SafeCatch? Well, I mean, if, please follow all our social handles. You can go, you know, we're at SafeCatch, um, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we have all the platforms. You can go to SafeCatch. Uh, dot com and you can um, register to get our newsletter um, and become a part of our community. And, you know, we can also love to receive through that community and through outreach in our and our um, social channels, different programs that your listeners might think would be the valuable things for us to do. As I said, we are far from perfect. We are an imperfect organization trying to do the right thing. And we count on you know, our community of supporters to help us learn to be better. So please, you know, don't just hear us like we're speaking from a position of, of no walls. We're far from it. We're just doing our best and, and trying to do better tomorrow. So we welcome you, Mitch, or any of your listeners to help participate in our education and help us find ways to, you know, allocate our resources in a way that can help the world. Well, Sean, thanks very much for spending time with us. Thank you, Mitch. This is a real honor. Thank you so much for your time. And thanks for allowing SafeCatch to be on your uh, podcast. We appreciate it. We've been talking with Sean Wittenberg. He's the founder of SafeCatch, a Sausalito, California distributor of responsibly caught seafood. And you can learn more about SafeCatch at safecatch.com. SafeCatch is all one word, no space, no dash. SafeCatch.com. You know, Sean talked about the deep and often overlooked connections between different human systems that contribute to the destruction of nature in unexpected ways. As we speak, delegates from around the world are meeting at the UN's Conference of Parties, or COP27, in Egypt. And part of the conversation there is how wealthy nations can support environmental improvements in emerging economies. If we can halt the increases in mercury contaminations in our seas by funding scrubbers for coal-burning power plants that allow India and parts of Africa to advance their economies, those investments can pay off in improvements around the world. Too often, we talk about carbon in isolation or biodiversity in isolation without recognizing how we can make systemic changes with global impacts by investing in point solutions that appear isolated, but are in fact changing the planet's biosphere. 
We did damage systematically for two centuries. Now we can start making repairs systematically by understanding those connections better. And I urge you to take a moment to visit SafeCatch and make suggestions about how they can improve their products and their packaging. Let's take Sean up on his offer to co-create a sustainable seafood supply. We all need to get involved with the companies that we give our business to, to get them to make the changes we all need as a species and as participants in the life of this planet. I hope you take a few minutes to share our show with your friends, family, neighbors, your coworkers. Folks, you're the amplifiers that spread the ideas we collect here on sustainability in your ear. And we'd appreciate it if you'd let people know that they can find our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, iHeartRadio, and other fine purveyors of podcast goodness. I will deeply appreciate your support. Thank you. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. We'll be back with another Innovator interview soon. In the meantime, Folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day.